Hey, y'all. Hey, now, can you hear me? I have myself muted. I wasn't talking. I was being quiet. Hello, Kimberly. How are you? Welcome, 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 welcome. Hopefully everything works tonight and I don't have to... Hey, Melissa Jade, how are you? I don't have to uh, go through all the rigmarole I went through last night because I ain't in the mood. Did any of you guys do your homework and watch Death of a Cheerleader between last night and tonight at some point? I did. Because I'm, you know, you know how I roll, y'all. Hey, Jenny G, how are you? We're just waiting for everybody to get in here and then we're going to start. There's a little twist, Melissa Jade, for, with the tinfoil hat. Maybe I'll get you. Maybe you can go down this rabbit hole. Be fun for you. You know how I can't be getting myself down a rabbit hole. I got bad knees from soccer and a bad back from children. So I can get down there. I just can't get back up. So I'll let you go down for me. You're younger. You can do it. Hey, Molson man. How are you? How are you? Getting, we're just chillax in a minute. Let everybody get in and get their seats. Hey, Sam, you're supposed to be making me mace. What are you doing in here? I'm glad you're here though. You know, I love it when you're here. I was going to watch the newer version today, but, um, I was monkeying around, uh, putting everything together, their little finishing touches for tonight and then the one for tomorrow. And then I was like, oh, snap, I better watch that. So I watched it and then I didn't have time to watch the next one. So I didn't get to, to watch the newer released version. But I got to say the the original, it does hold up well. It really does. I was kind of surprised. Usually when I go back and watch like old Lifetime movies, they're not except for a woman scorned, Betty, the Betty Broderick story, because that stands the test of time. I don't care. But other ones that I used to like a whole lot, they don't. Like I go back and watch and I'm like, why did I like this? So... I heard about your phone, Melissa. That's a bummer. What happened? I thought so too, Team Psych Ward. And I thought that the original one was really close to what actually happened. I mean, almost like super close, super duper close. Oh, I got to check something just real quick. Hold on. I forgot one little thing that I need to do. Just, just real, real quick. Mm. Okay. That's what I thought. I just couldn't remember. Oh, no. Aren't, isn't, I, I'm an Android girl, so, um, but I, even I know that isn't it, isn't out, isn't the iPhone up to like 12 now? Is that, isn't that what they're, they're up to? Bless it, Melissa. Well, what do you guys think? Should we just go ahead and get started? Put something in the chat. I don't want to, like, if you guys are ready, let's, we can do it. Just let me know. Oh my they're up to a 13, Melissa Jade. Oh my gosh. So last night when I was live, <clears throat> my daughter um, made guacamole for the first time all on her own. And I got to tell you guys, she did a really, really good job. I only had to like just, just tweak it a teeny tiny bit. So 13, my gosh. Is that the one that's like super duper like huge? See, I can't, I don't like the the big ones. I don't know. I don't, that didn't come out right. You know what I mean? Like the big phones. It's almost, that they're almost the size of like a small tablet. It's too much for me. I can't have, uh, 
Like this is why I don't go to the movie theater because the screen is so big that it gets that it's overwhelming to me. And instead of uh, focusing on what's I'm supposed to be focusing on, meaning the forefront, I'm trying to figure out what the picture on the wall is or what that little tchotchke on the bookshelf is. I just get so I get overwhelmed. I can focus if it's something like I really, really want to see, but. Me too. I love guacamole. It's my favorite. I could eat it, but it's, it's so it's rich and uh, it's, I'm not supposed to be eating like this. Well, like, like if I were just to eat the guacamole by itself, I guess it would be okay, but I like to eat it with the chips and um, I'm not supposed to be having chips because I got a little troubles around the belly and I need to get it off. And the only way to do that is to not be eating things that I'm not. Why does that sound 13, 16? So oh my God, I can't even talk. There's too many numbers, Molson man. Could you break that up into two different sentences? Six inches. That's half a ruler. That's too damn big. Now we're going the opposite. Cause like, remember back in the day when the uh, it started out and they were super clunky, right? Those huge Motorola cell phones. And then they got really, really small. And now we're going back the other way. So, all right. I guess I'm going to go ahead and get started. I think I've made you guys wait enough. So here we go. Hopefully this works. Okay, so is, can everybody still hear me? Am I still good? Because usually that's when it likes to mess up. I feel like I'm okay. I think I might see my little bubble moving. Just let me know. Because I don't want to start if there's going to be an issue. Okay, good. All right. So... This is the case of uh, Kirsten Costas and Bernadette Prati. Now, they both were uh, sophomores at uh, Marymount High School in California. So it was like an affluent neighborhood, affluent area, kind of by um, San Diego. And <clears throat> so... Friends kind of describe Kirsten as fun, outgoing. Um, she's m mainly known for um, being a cheerleader, but actually she was on the varsity swim team. So she was, thank you, Jenny. So she was a, um, an athlete, you know, not just, not that a cheerleader is not an athlete, but she also was a, on the varsity swim team. And I was on the swim team when I was young too. And I, I can tell you that's hard stuff. Like it's not, it's not an easy sport. Um, but, you know, for the most part, she she was, you know, well-liked. She was pretty popular. Okay. So all of this took place in the summer, really June of 1984. However, the trouble between the two girls actually started. See, they, this was, they were out of school for the summer and it had, it was, uh, they were going into their junior year, right? So sort of, yeah. So it really was over their sophomore year in high school that they, um, that, that there became issues. 
And so I'll show you, hold on a second. So that's Kirsten. She was 15. And she, when she died, she was uh, she, almost exactly one month from turning 16. So here is, all right. So that's uh, Bernadette Prati. Okay. They were the same age. Now, um, Bernadette's family wasn't quite as affluent as Kirsten's was, but they weren't, um, this wasn't like a, a, a pretty and pink situation, right? Where she was on the wrong side of the tracks or anything, but her parents were significantly older and she, you know, her, the house did have some, um, paint peeling and they did drive a Pinto, but, um, she just always, she, she thought that she was made for better stuff than that. And so, you know, she had higher aspirations. And so sophomore, she worked really, really hard. Bernadette did to ingratiate herself sort of into the cool girls click. Okay. She had, uh, gotten a job in the office alongside of Kirsten and uh, so that part, I don't know if you, for those of you who have seen the original, and I, I don't know what the remake is, but I'm assuming that it's probably real similar. They just changed the actress and actresses. So um, that part of the movie is true. She did have a, a job in the school front office, and she did um, do little favors for Kirsten and her friends, giving them excuse, you know, passes and stuff like that and excuse notes and all that business. So that part of it, you got to check it out, Melissa. It's on Prime. Um, so that part is in the, from the movie is, is accurate. So Bernadette is really, she wasn't always comfortable with the things that, uh, Kirsten asked her to do. I mean, it wasn't anything like felonious or anything like that. She just, um, you know, like giving them excuses and stuff like that. She didn't really want to do it, but she really wanted to fit in with, uh, Kirsten and, and her group of friends. So the other thing that she did was uh, join the Bobbies. And it was sort of uh, described as, um, well, it was intended to be like a volunteer group. It was a bunch of girls and they did, you know, a, a lot of volunteer work and charity stuff, right? Um, but they were known around the school really for, for being like cliquish and popular and mainly parties. That's what they were, were really known for. So the other part that is true from the movie and almost exactly spot on is the part about the ski trip. So that year there was a ski trip for the sophomore class and Bernadette did go and she did have to earn money in order to be able to not only go, but also to buy, you know, the ski outfits and stuff like that. And so she was a little un kind of embarrassed and a little uncomfortable about the, um, her skis, her and her outfit. She, she did, she lacked a lot of self-confidence. She's not a bad looking girl. She was not overweight or anything, but she had a lot of, of body images. I mean, she was 15 and, you know, just insecure. And that's the way, you know, that's really what the crux of all of this is. So as, as the sophomore year progresses, um, Bernadette just never could, never did feel like she really like clicked with Kirsten, who is who she, not only did she want to be friends with her, but she wanted to be and emulate her. And Kirsten made it look so very easy. You know, she was very popular. She was well thought of. She was a good athlete. They both did try out for cheerleader. Bernadette did not make it, but Kirsten did. And so she was really on, she was sort of, she, she was like on the peripheral of what the click that she just really wanted to be in. Okay. So as it as the the school year comes to an end bernadette really finds herself more on the outs and and especially with um kirsten and so what she did 
which is also very, very similar, is she did plan a ruse to get Kirsten to come out saying that they were going to go to a party. And that was the intention for that night. At least that's what Bernadette says. All right, but we'll get there. So she gets Kirsten to come out with her and she's driving her family's uh, Pinto. Okay. And they, so she picks her up and they do go, Hey Momo. And they do go to the church and um, Kirsten lights up a joint and offers it to Bernadette. And Bernadette says she doesn't want it. And then Kirsten, then they exchange some words and uh, Kirsten gets out of the, 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 the car and ends, and this was on um, June 23rd. Okay. So she gets out of the car and flees to the neighbor's house, uh, Alex and Mary Arnold's house. Okay. And she knocks on the door. She says her parents aren't home. Um, can she use their phone? So they let her in, right? And she calls home and there's no answer. They're not there. So um, Alex decides to go ahead and give her a ride home. Okay. And he is aware that at the time, as he's driving uh, Kirsten to her house, that there is a vehicle following them. He is, he sees the Pinto. Okay. Okay. But he drops her off and he does see the confrontation between the two girls, okay? But what he said later on is that he really didn't, he thought it was just an argument, maybe like a, a little fist fight, nothing super serious. And, and after all, she was at her house, right? So he, he drives off. Well, what actually happened is that Bernadette stabbed Kirsten five times with an 18 inch long knife. Okay. And <clears throat> so Bernadette or not Bernadette, Kirsten sort of stumbles around and then it really was Molson. So um, Kirsten is, is stumbling around and you know, the neighbors find her, the ambulance is called, and Kirsten later at the hospital ends up succumbing to her injuries and she dies. And um, the police are just like completely baffled because, yeah, they they talked to the uh, gentleman, uh, Mr. Um, Arnold, who had given Kirsten a, uh, Kirsten a ride home, but he couldn't really describe he didn't see Bernadette. So he couldn't describe her in any type of detail. Okay. And the only thing that they had to go on, the only lead they had at that time was the Pinto. Well, I mean, this is 1984. So literally they're going through the vehicle registrations, but it's not the way they do it now, which is on computer. They're literally going through paperwork of every single uh, registered light colored pinto from you know that area or whatever and it was taking them a really really long time so in the in the meantime all of this is going on they're interviewing people okay they're interviewing uh all of kirsten's friends and they actually did interview uh bernadette not only did they interview her they gave her a polygraph test okay and but she appeared to have an alibi. She said that she was babysitting for this family until, you know, I think 11 or something at night. And so totally, she, she, they thought, you know, first they thought that she had an alibi. So while they're doing what they can with what they have, hang on just a second, I got a cough. Sorry. So while they're the police are doing what they can and really not finding out a whole lot, they're kind of at their wits end and at their they're kind of exhausting all of these leads. The the family of Kirsten hires a PI. 
Okay. But in between all of that is Nancy Kane. And this is what Nancy Kane looked like in 84. And this is what she looks like now. So Nancy Kane was, well, they describe her as goth, but that's, I doubt that that's like accurate because it was 1984 and goth wasn't a thing until the 90s. So what I would say is she was probably like, um, like a new wave back in the day. So she was into the cure. She wore a lot of black. She had like blonde and black hair at the same time. She had that really cool bleached that had that duo color or whatever from back then that was kind of cool or whatever. And she, she was not a fan of Kirsten. She, Oh, thank you. Not your mama. So sweet. I'm glad you're here, babe. Um, she was not a fan of Kirsten. She found that Kirsten was condescending. She could be cruel. She made jokes at other people's uh, expenses. She was not a nice girl. And even in this still right here is from uh, ID did a um, uh, an episode. It's uh, in the series, uh, the deadly 1980s, the deadliest decade. And I, it's the season two, episode three, I believe it is. And that's what this still is from. And she really didn't mince any words, but the community just treated her like an absolute pariah. And part of it was because obviously Nancy was questioned, right? But she didn't have an alibi. And the reason that she didn't have an alibi is because she, she had lied to her parents and uh, went down to... Um, Oh crap, I forget now where she went. She went to, to to a to see a concert where she wasn't supposed to be in like, you know, so she, she didn't have an alibi that at that time. Of course, later it came out, you know, that she did, but the the school just terrorized her. They spray painted her locker with killer. They um spray painted her house and she ended up having to change schools. So that time goes on and it takes them like six months. Okay. So then in the, so the family of Kirsten Casas, they hire a private investigator because the cops are just, you know, they're just at a dead end. So they hire a private investigator and the private investigator starts going through things and he comes on up onto Bernadette. Well, he called the family that Bernadette said that she was babysitting for. And when he called them, they said she wasn't babysitting here that night. So he turns that over to the detectives. So then um, on December, is it December? Yes, all the way in December, okay? So this took place on, on June 23rd. Then December 9th, the police question Bernadette for the second time. Okay. And they confront her with the fact that she failed her polygraph test, but they didn't have anything really solid to go on. They actually needed her to confess. Okay. So they very similar, at, like to what happened in the movie, they tell her that, um, you know, they've done a profile on who they think killed Kirsten. And so they start reading off, you know, the profile and um, she, Bernadette says, sounds like me. And so um, they end up letting her go. And then what happens is she, it sure was Molson man. So what ends up happening is she ends up writing this letter to her parents and she is, it's, it's a confession and she is, she confesses, she apologizes. She says that she can't, she wrote the letter because she can't face them and tell them what she has done. And she's so sorry to be such a horrible disappointment. So the letter that is in the movie is the uh, is almost verbatim what the actual letter was. So 
her mother ends up reading this. Okay. And she does, she also talks in the letter about how the man from the FBI thinks that she did it and he's right. So the mom, her mother reads the letter, right? And hauls ass down to the high school and picks her up and takes her into the police station and she confesses. And <clears throat> Bernadette says that it was an accident, not an accident, but it was a, a spur of the moment thing that when she called Kirsten and, and invited her out all those months, months before, but she, she, her, she always intended to go to the party. It was in the parking lot that they got into some type of argument and, and Bernadette doesn't talk about what the argument was or what was said. She said she was mean to her. That's all she'll say. Okay. And that she didn't bring the knife with her, that the knife was in there because her sister liked to cut vegetables in the car and the cops are not buying this. There's, you know, they're thinking, well, who cuts knife? who cuts uh, vegetables with 18, with an 18 inch butcher knife? I mean, that is pardon the pun, but it's overkill, frankly, for a vegetable. You, a paring knife would work. Um, I don't know what she was doing with that big, huge knife. So they, obviously, they charge her and they arrest her. All right. So then it comes to the trial. Now, in 1984, very, very different than, than the way that we would have handled a, a 15, 16-year-old kid at, who had committed murder today, they would be most likely be tried as an adult, but she was not. She was tried as a juvenile. And the interesting thing about it is this, whether they had charged her with first degree murder or second degree murder, the sentence would have been the same. She would have been remanded to, to state, uh, to the juvenile authorities until the age of 25. So either one. So there was actually no real reason to have a, a trial. But even though her attorney tried to negotiate with the prosecution, because either way, she would have been sentenced the same, right? <clears throat> but the prosecutor would not budge. And a lot of people, a lot around the area that, you know, were there at the time really felt like, um, both girls were put on trial and it was for no reason. And essentially it humiliated both families because obviously it came out that, um, that Kirsten had offered Bernadette a joint. And this is the other part of the story that um, people have, have, have contradicted. So when Bernadette tells the police that uh, Kirsten offered her a joint and she said, no, her friends say there's no way that Bernadette would have said no because she wanted Kirsten to like her so much and she was such a follower that she actually would have said yes. So they were not buying that. And the police and the prosecutor never bought that it was an impulsive, reactive stabbing, a, a, a crime of passion, if you will. They felt that it was premeditated murder. So they, she ends up going to court. And on April 1st, 1985, she is found guilty of second degree murder. And she is sentenced to the maximum at that time, which would have been nine years. Okay. Now here's the twist. Hold on. Let me get it up. Okay. Well, I mean, it was 1984 and Nancy Reagan was telling everybody to just say no. <laughs> Molson, man. So Bernadette Prodi is released after she was sentenced to nine. She served uh, seven. She was released at, in 1992 at the age of... 23. Now here's where the twist comes in. 
because if you go to look up Bernadette Prati now, you will cut, you will stumble across this blog and I'm not gonna, um, like, because I'm not exactly sure what the deal is with this blog, so I'm not going to promote it, but you all know how to work the Googles. So, um, y'all see her name. It's right here. So go ahead and hit up them Googles and you'll find it. But there is this blogger who is a thousand percent convinced that Bernadette Prati changed her name to Jeanette To. I, I don't know I'm probably going to say it right. It's either Tomanka or Tomenka. Okay. And that um, she is, she has written it for medical journals. Okay. And this is his proof. This is, there is a uh, Twitter account. There is a Pinterest, a Facebook, and his uh, evidence that this is what she changed her name to is that there have been people on these various social media sites that refer to her as Bernie, okay? Officially, though, the way that it's listed is that Jeanette, changed, she changed her name, Bernadette changed her name, this is a tongue twister, to Jeanette Butler, and she lives in Oklahoma and is now a nurse, so this is the rabbit hole. And I started to go down it a little bit today, but then I was like, if I go in down this rabbit hole, I'm not going to get back out. And I'm, you know, I just could never find, I can't say for sure. Do I think that these two women look similar? I do. do but I cannot say with any amount of certainty that this is uh, the same person, but I'll let you guys make the decision. And the reason this this blogger is so upset about it is because he feels that why should she be allowed to live in anonymity given what she has done? Kristen's Kirsten's parents and their family have are never going to be the same. Their lives were forever changed. They had left California, they moved to Hawaii, um, and they lost their 15 year old daughter and, and she's gone on and, and from this person's digging that this Jeanette Tomanka Tomanka has gone on to become successful and he is not pleased about it. And he, they, they will take his, had his blog taken down a bunch and then um, he'll just make another one. And, and so anyway, that's, that's the story of Bernadette Prati. I will say this though, and the other, the only other, the other reason he believes they're the same person, not only because of the, their facial features being similar, but <clears throat> when Bernadette was released from the juvenile authority in California, um, she graduated high school in there with the 4.0 average, and she was even taking some college. I mean, everybody from back in that time will tell you that she was an excellent student and very, very smart. And so she would be quite capable to go on and whether she is a nurse or like this gentleman says, she's writing for medical journals. Um, it, she was intelligent enough to do it. And I think that in his other, his other issue is that had she been tried in later in the 80s or even uh, into the early 90s, she would still be in prison today. But one could, as we do on this channel and in true crime, make the case that not all 15-year-olds who do things like this are throwaways. One could argue that the, she was one way when she entered the system at 15 and she has worked the rest of her life to, she served her time. And when she got out, she became a productive member of society up. I mean, including being a nurse. I mean, the only thing that's more helpful than a nurse would be a doctor, right? You know, so one could argue that are we being too strict 
when kids commit these crimes that we're throwing them away for the rest of their life when there are examples of of kids who weren't and that they've gone on to be productive members of society. So that's it. That's all I got for this story. Guess um I don't know if anybody wants to come up. I'm sort of out of things to say. Usually the the live gets like messed up by this point. I'm I'm so shocked that it went so smooth with the visuals and my displays. I'm kind of I don't know what to do. So, anyway. That's all I got unless you guys have questions or you want to talk about it. Let me look at my phone cuz StreamYard never works. I know nonstop mom. I don't know what to do. It feels weird that there were no hiccups. I didn't lose audio. StreamYard didn't boot me out. Shmita was doing an excellent job hi highlighting the comments. Whew, this was a good stream. All right. Well, then if that's that, guys, I guess I'm going to bounce. Oh, you want to talk about Delphi? What would you like to talk about with Delphi? I've, 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 I've been keeping up. I'm, I'm, I'm watching. I'm finding something. I'm finding the things that are coming out uh, at these last few days. Very, very interesting. Um, I find it even. Um, no, Shamita did not press 11 billion buttons in the back. Well done, Shamita. Love you too, Sam. Thank you, babe. Go make memes if you want to. Yeah, I did. Molson, you want to come up? You don't have to. No pressure. Um, okay, so I'm in, I've been watching. I've been perusing around these YouTube streets and seeing what everybody had to say. I watched the um, officers. Um, the public information officer give his little, you know, speech and what was going on in the case. And I, I find it interesting, but I think what I find even more interesting about it is that this isn't actually new information that there we were, uh, groups on, on the Facebooks that were doing their own investigating and went to the girls' social media and found this, um, I'm going to mess his name up. Is it Anthony Schott? Is that what it is? Um, too much. I have too much true crime in my brain right now. It's too many names, too many people. So that they had found, um, I think that's right, Anthony Schott, that they had found him as a follower on one of the girls or both of the girls Instagram accounts. And I'm, and so I find that to be very, very interesting, which obviously it, it's not the person because the person in the pictures of the Anthony shot account, right. It has been tracked down and it's obviously it was a catfish. Um, but now they're asking for, the public's help and like for, um, you know, like for, well, they're all adults now. So back when the, they were the girl's age to, to, you know, if they had any contact with this person, but I just think how come, I wonder what took so long for them to, yes, nonstop mom. I wonder what, why they took so long to have they known about this this whole time is this something is this new information to them or is it just new information that they're giving to the public meaning they have known about it but now they feel comfortable in that they have eliminated the um person in the picture as a potential suspect having nothing to do with that account and so now they're free to um put it out publicly I'm very curious about that because I don't know if any of you guys watch um, on ID. They have a show called Web of Lies 
and they're forever. And everything that, you know, that that show talks about every case that they cover is, has something to do with the internet. And there've been many situations where it was a catfish type situation and, um, how daunting and, um, and tedious, but it was to be able to get to who actually created the account. So I'm wondering if what's going on with that, where they, are they struggling? And so they need some type of help and hint as to what direction to go in from the public. Was this person so great at covering their digital footprint that they are, they can't trace it back. It's very, very interesting, but Lord, I really hope that this case gets solved. Those poor, those poor girls, their families. Hello, Granny's watching. What you doing? Um, hi, Kelly. Hi, hi, hi. Yeah. So, like, I was blown away when um, I was, you know how I do. It gets quiet, and I'm like, hmm, I wonder what's going on on these YouTube streets. So. I pushed YouTube, boom, it's all in my feed. And I was like, oh my God, let me click. So I watched and I mean, my mouth was open the whole time. I was so shocked and excited and then confused because if, let's be honest, if regular old people like you and me who just join a Facebook group or YouTube or whatever, because we're interested in a specific case, and then we get to do the digging. If they unearth this, surely, surely the cops did. And that I, I agree with you, um, nonstop mom. Like it makes me wonder why didn't they? Because obviously um, watching Web of Lies, it's not like I can't with you, Molson, man. I can't. No more napkin gate. Um <laughs> Anyway, oh, let me drop the link if anybody wants to come up and chat. We could do that. Um, anyway, so I was like, I was kind of thinking to myself, well, okay, I've watched that show and it's an hour long show. And by the end of the show, obviously the crime is solved, right? But that's not like, that's not how it happens. It's not accurate. And I know that. Okay. But it feels like to me that if they're just now releasing this information to the public, it feels to me like they are stumped. I don't know. Yeah, see, no evil is a good one too. Sometimes I don't like that one though. I like it, but I don't like it. It depends on um, the the story or whatever. My The one that I like the most is um, Evil Lives Here. That's the one I like to watch the most. So... Oh, thank you, Callie. Well, this case, babe, this is an old case um, and it's it's solved. The girl did her time and she's been released and and all that. I just um, I do want to start going back and looking at some cases that. Oh, yeah. Fear thy neighbors a good one, too, um, that don't get a lot of attention for whatever reason. And. I was talking last night with Molson man and it's difficult for me um, to you're, Oh, you're welcome, Callie. Thanks for coming. Um, anyway, it's difficult for me to discuss uh, current open cases. And I mean, like they're new now, not unsolved crimes from, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, but, because I, ne I never want to, to do anything inadvertently, right, to jeopardize a case. And I, I, um, oi I'm always worried about that because I don't know. You know how I, I am. Oh, they sent. Okay, so it's with the jury now. Okay, so I kind of like was um, monkeying around today as I do. I'm all over the internet all the days, right? And I flit around on the YouTubes quite frequently and that I was starting to watch the case, but then I 
I got distracted. I don't, I can't even give you a good reason why I got distracted. I don't even know what it was that distracted me. Quite honestly, I feel like I had the idea that my daughter made guacamole and it was getting to be like lunchtime. And I was like, I'm going to go get some guacamole and chips. And then I come back with the guacamole and chips and I forgot what I was doing in the first place. So that's probably what happened. It's right on brand for me. So that's, <laughs> that's kind of how I roll. Oh, wait, hold on. Let me, um, I will, let me scroll up. Shamita, help. I put the um the link in, but now I don't remember where I put it. Here, I'll just copy it again and pin it in case anybody wants to come up and chit chat. All right, hold on. Yeah, I can't well, I can't watch anything going on with the Duggar case either. Callie, like I just how come I can only put myself in timeout or block user? Hold on. Let me go on my, I'll do it from my phone. Oh my God. There. Um, stupid stream yard. It tried to get, I, I didn't hold down on it long enough and I clicked to go into my own stream yard. Yeah. It's going to be one of those nights, but, um, yeah, I can't, I cannot watch the Duggar case either. I just, I, I just can't. There are some cases for me that are just, it's too much and I can't, I can't handle it, but yeah, napkin gate, for reals, just blame me. I'm litter, I'm the worst. Everybody knows that I'm the worst. I do all the things, all the time, all the days. So, it's me. I, now, Maxwell, I am keeping up with, because, obviously. Um, and... I'm not going to say anything because for me, I sort of like to watch and then talk. Like I need to see some more before I'm ready to give my opinion on it. But I'm watching that case, um, of course. But I just, I refuse. I just can't watch. Um, well, Hold on a second. Let me see what's happening in the chat because I want to answer this question. Um, I, I think Callie from, from, this is the way that I understand it. So Core TV is back. Okay. But also Law and Crime Network, when Core TV dipped, Law and Crime Network took over and they stream like a ton of trials, okay? But I feel like although people are allowed to witness trials, it's part of the process, um, I, I think that some judges don't allow cameras in the courtroom for whatever reason. And the truth of the matter is at the end of the day for every trial, it is the judge's discretion whether cameras are allowed in the trial or not. So it could be that it's not being shown because the judge doesn't want it shown and didn't allow the cameras. I feel like with, um, Smollett and, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell, I feel like there was no way that the judge, whoever it was, I would have been very shocked. Um, federal cases can be um, televised. I can't remember if Timothy McVeigh was televised or not. So I feel like that might be... Um, one of the reasons why. And I, yeah, 
I don't, I don't remember it um, being televised. I remember, um, hi, Amy. I don't remember it being televised. I do remember there being stills and the drawings from the courtroom, but I don't remember it being televised. I don't. I don't. That might be what it is, Nolson Man, because I don't remember it being televised. So I'm, you know, there's some interesting trials going on now. Obviously, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell is one that I'm completely fascinated in. Um, who's coming up, though, on the dockets? Let's see. We know it's not going to be Valo Daybell because that's for 2023. Um, Stouk, Leticia Stouk is coming up. Um, I think who else is coming up? I know I was excited for Durst, which is over, and I was I know I was excited for interested in uh Stauk and Vallow, but I feel like there was other ones. I don't know, I have to look her up. It's been a minute since I last checked because I the last I heard with her, which to be fair, it's been a while and I haven't really been keeping up with all of her stuff, but the last I heard, which really shocked me. Um, was that the judge allowed her to represent herself. So it may be a while before we hear anything because, um, oh, Morphew too. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Kelly Morphew. How could I forget him? Um, I feel like um, with Stout, if she's still representing herself, remember she gets discovery. So can you imagine her discovery and she's has to go through everything, every bit of the discovery and file on her own. So if she intends to, uh, want any contest, any of the evidence, she's going to have to file with the court each piece and then argue and be successful at arguing and convincing the judge that they shouldn't admit certain evidence. I can't even believe she would ever think that she, it would be a good idea to represent herself. I will never understand that. Even lawyer, although Ted Bundy did, but he, he still had, um, also he had representation too. And his, he wanted to do it. This is completely different than what Leticia is doing it for. Leticia thinks she's smart enough to do it, but Bundy wanted to do it because he knew that there were survivors from the sorority house and he wanted an opportunity to cross-examine them and re-victimize them because he's a psychopath and a monster. And I never thought he was good looking. I, I, I remember, um, you know, reading about him and stuff like that. And, and, you know, everybody's saying, oh, he's so handsome. And all I could ever see on him was the unibrow. And like, he's not good looking. I don't see what you people are saying to me. He doesn't look good looking at all. Oh, thank you, Momo. I can't remember if, um, I don't remember. I don't know what they've done with her. Like, that's what I'm saying. The last I heard was that um, she was granted permission to represent herself. So, but I'm, I can't imagine that she is sticking to that. Like, I, I feel like she might've thought it was a good idea in her head until she realized what all she actually has to do. And I don't think people realize that what really goes into, um, preparing for a trial like that on both sides, it's daunting. Yes. Callie, the night stalker. I, 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 Richard run me it is I, I I don't know people thought he was good looking but his victims all said he was he stunk and he was disgusting and I I mean obviously when he would show up to court he was you know sort of cleaned up I guess they you know because he had access to a shower or whatever but I watched the thing on Netflix and um it's been a long long time since I um had read anything about that case. And when I watched the thing on Netflix, I didn't 
I didn't realize um, all of his crimes. And I'm just going to leave it at that. Yes, Callie. Yeah, that's the thing about um, Bundy. He was a savage. But what's interesting about Bundy is um, when he talked about the crimes, he never said I, he always said the killer, which I always thought was interesting. It was his way of distancing himself from the crimes, but there were certain aspects of the crimes that he never would admit to. He wouldn't talk about it. And a lot of what a lot of people don't know is that he is, he is suspected and he did talk about this, but I don't think that it was part of the Bundy tapes that Netflix did. Um, Oh, I'll have to look into that sugar beet. Anyway, um, what a lot of people don't know about Ted Bundy is that he was actually um, a suspect in a crime where he grew up of a little girl, 10 years old. And um, they think he committed that crime. And I know that he has talked about it. And that's when he went by the name of uh, Theodore his original name before it was changed to Bundy. I keep wanting to say Kaczynski, but I know that's not right. That doesn't sound right to me, but whatever it was um, before he changed it to Bundy. But yeah, he was suspected in killing his little uh, neighbor girl. Yeah, Callie, it was a lot. It was a lot. Who are you talking about, Molson man? Hold on. Uh, let me uh, scroll up. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> I just thought it, I just, um, I don't, un, Ted Bundy is interesting in that. The ruse that he used was interesting to me because he, when I watch him, I don't see what other people see. I don't see, and I'm taught, I don't know. I get, I just don't, I don't, I don't see the guy next door. I don't hear the guy. It's not even seeing, it's hearing. I don't hear the guy next door when he speaks. There's just something icky about him. And I, I mean, it's, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have to, can't, I can't, I just, I can't, I have to, this is such a heavy subject that I have to throw like humor in every once in a while. Cause otherwise, Hey, Max 2002, what up, what up, what up? I, I have to like throw a little, I just, I, I'm, I don't know if it's because I know what he did or what, but to me, I just don't, he gives off creepy vibes, but I do think it's interesting that he is the one who helped catch, um, Gary Ridgeway, the green, um, uh, the green river killer, which I thought was interesting because I don't think they were, um, I wonder that too, granny. Like, I wonder if I don't want to call you that because, I know that's your channel name, but I know everybody for everybody calls you Jessica Lynn. So if that's okay, I'm just going to call you Jessica. But um, yeah, I, I don't know if it's because we know or not. I don't know what that, what it is about me, about him, or if that's what it is or not. Like, I'm not even making sense. I probably should stop this live because now I'm just babbling. But yeah, um, I don't think without Bundy's help, I really think that um, it would have been all, almost impossible to have caught the green river killer because of um he did take a lot of countermeasures uh to um to hide his to distance himself from his crimes and um the people that he picked 
which the women were prostitutes and they live a very vagrant lifestyle. So when their families or even their friends report them missing, it's not taken seriously, which is unfortunate because I feel like, oh, thank you, Granny Good. <laughs> I mean, Jessica, sorry. Um, I feel like um, I, th I think a lot of serial killers could have been like Sam Little could have been stopped earlier if you're um, if you're the if you're the police, right, or detectives, and suddenly you're getting a rash of missing prostitutes being reported as well as you're finding dead prostitutes, I feel like it shouldn't take, I get it back then, but we know better now. And I feel like they shouldn't be able to get away with it as long as they do because of this, because of their choice in victim. I think it's sad because those women are humans and they have families. They have, they are somebody's sister, somebody's daughter, somebody's aunt, sometimes a lot of times somebody's mother, et cetera. And so I think it's terrible the way they just, you know, don't uh, pay attention like that. Let me see what you guys are talking. I don't know uh, why that is, Callie. I don't know. Well, the thing is, Jessica, is, okay, so you know how, like, there's real world el etiquette and then there's YouTube etiquette. And so... I know like all my mods, like government names, you know, but I never call them their government name when we're on YouTube together. It's like one of those etiquette things that you are supposed to refer to the person as their channel by their channel name. It's like an unspoken, um, weird YouTube etiquette rule that's not even written anywhere, you know, even like the, even the pirate code is written down somewhere, but like the YouTube etiquette rules aren't. And so everybody is, everybody just calls you that because that's your cha uh, channel name. So yeah. And it is, it is, it does have something to do with, you are right, Callie, with the frontal lobe. It, um, they, they have done studies, they have done brain scans, and in the way that the frontal lobe, which is what controls your emotions, your impulse, all, you know, they, it's, they're damaged. And that's why there's always that argument between nature and nurture, because what makes a, a serial killer? What, you know, and I, I am of the belief that I think it's a combination of both. Now, I will say that as far as brain development goes, you know, if, if the mother is healthy and, you know, there's no, because a lot of times there's, not so much now because we know better, but back then, you know, women who were pregnant were allowed to take medications that now we know affect the baby. For example, um, oh my God, his name is on the tip of my tongue. He ate people. Why can't I think of his, I see his face. Help me, help me, help me. Um, what is it? Dahmer, Jeffrey Dahmer. We know that his mom um, was prescribed um, anticonvulsant medication that um, now we know uh, the baby gets some of that. The baby, it crosses the placenta and it affects the baby. And so she always wondered if the reason, if part of the reason that, that Jeffrey was the way that he was is because of the medication that she was prescribed by her doctor. So, I mean, you have to think about just biology. I mean, the way human beings are made is it starts out as two cells, right? And then multiplies exponentially until you have a whole person. 
and it's con and and as the baby is growing all of the things are continuing to develop so in, when you're when you think about it in that way there's always the potential for something to go wrong just in that process alone right that's why some children have little you know defects and stuff like that so um it's always interesting to me to look back on people like Jeffrey Dahmer and uh, Ted Bundy, because you're, I was just bringing that, going to say that it's an excellent point. Team psych ward. Not only was Bundy, he grew up in an abusive environment. So he, he grew up with, in his grandparents' home, and his grandfather was was an alcoholic and and verbally abusive, and so who knows what you know what all he witnessed. And the thing of it is, is that when Bundy talks about his childhood, he doesn't talk about it in that manner. He uh, talks about it. Well, the claim is that um, his grandfather is actually his father. So, um, anyway, that's, that's the claim and that, um, that at some point he found out about it and that it, it screwed up, it screwed him up. But when he talks about his childhood, he doesn't talk about that part. It's very weird how he describes his childhood. As, if I'm not mistaken, I believe he actually used the word idyllic and I don't, th I think it was anything but, um, idyllic, right? And then. But they didn't always live there. Like his mom married, and that's how um, he got the last name Bundy. And then they moved. So um, you know, it's difficult to understand what. Yeah, something like it was something like that. Team psych ward, something super like I don't know, like messed up. But he won't talk about it, and so because he won't talk about it, like you can know things from talking to other people, right? Like the FBI behavioral sciences, they studied him and they, and, but you can't know how that impacted a person who won't acknowledge that it happened, which is part of it. So what happened with, with Ted Bundy? Was it nature or was it nurture? And I really do think with in situation, I think there are, I think, yes, there are certain times when some people are just born. It's possible for people to be born bad, but I don't think, I, I don't know. I, I, I will, I waver frequently because I think that, um, you can, you know, you can take children who grew up in the most abhorrent and abysmal living situations. And if they didn't tell you, you would never know. So I, I, you know, I think it's difficult to, to really say for sure, you know, because if you look at it, like I was saying with Dahmer, it's interesting because for a long time, people thought that he had this really great home life growing up. And the truth was, that's not true. His parents fought frequently. There was a lot of silence in the home when they weren't speaking to one another um, or to him. Then when he came home, um, when he was, what, 17, came home from school after his parents had divorced and his mom and his younger brother had just left the home, just moved and left him there. Um, so I would say, you know, obviously there's different forms of abuse, but, uh, but it uh, affects people, you know, he, he wasn't physically abused, but I think that the way that there was, um, the fighting and then the silence in the home. I think that it's very likely and it does make sense that it would contribute to his abandonment issues, which is really kind of what exactly max 2002. We don't know why. And I think people, I think that's part of the human condition, isn't it though, to find out these bigger questions. Why, why does that happen? How do you have two siblings in a home Right. And one of them grows up and is a productive and successful member of society. And another one is um, a criminal. I OK, let me think about this one. It's been a minute since I've uh, 
Let me get it. Let, let me look through my 11 billion tabs in my brains. I feel like the answer to that is no. I think the answer to that is that um, his first victim was on his way to a concert and he hitchhiked and Dahmer picked him up and invited him back to the house. I, but that was, <clears throat> excuse me, when he was in high school. But maybe you're right. I, it's been a long time since um, I have like looked into to Jeffrey Dahmer or read anything about Jeffrey Dahmer. So I probably, you might be right too. I feel like the name is, is correct, but I feel like um, when I watched, it's not Kemper on Kemper or Dahmer on Dahmer because that was Kemper on Kemper, but Dahmer did one too, similar to that. And I, I feel like that's the one that he talked about. He did, I mean, he was as open as he can be, you know, so When you hear the details, though, of the other victims, particularly the 13-year-old and how there was actually an intervention in that one and he could have been saved but wasn't, those are the ones. I mean, they're all heartbreaking, but those are the ones. I feel like that's right nonstop, Mom. I do. Okay. Okay. There you go. So see there, my 11 T billion tabs that I went through, I was, I was right. It's hard. It's, I have a lot of true crime, like, and pop culture, random stuff in my brain that I will remember. So yeah. Anyway, it's a lot of, it's a lot of interesting cases and of getting down to why they do what they do, which is what Molson man and I were talking about. Last night, why I'm in, why true crime fascinates me because we're all pretty well physically capable of taking another life. It's just that the majority of us, something in inside of us, other than in, in a situation where we have to, where it's you know our lives are threatened, that's different. I'm talking about straight cold blooded murder, right? We. So. She sure did, Sugar Beet. She sure did. She sure did. No, no, no. Tonight I've only got 50, 1100 tabs open. Not my, not my 11 T billion tabs. But yeah, it's, it's awful. Sugar Beet, she did. And she, even when the cops were starting to sort of walk away, she was insistent and still, they let him go. I'll never understand that. And I'm sure that that officer looks back on that night and that situation and sees things so much differently now and probably feels horrible about it, you know? So, see, that's, for, I don't, yeah, I get, yeah, that's true too, Max. It's, it's very possible. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to become a criminal. And let me tell you why. Um, mainly because I don't feel like I would look good in a prison jumpsuit orange. Although I, I do have a skin tone that I'm pretty much can wear whatever color. Orange is not a color that I particularly care for. I don't care to dress like a pumpkin year round. And also I feel like, um, I feel like they, I would be tested a lot and I'd have to be proving myself in the yard every day. And I just sort of feel like it's a hassle and not worth it, frankly. So I would probably not. Also, there's the whole, uh, moral and ethical dilemma of becoming a murderer, which, you know, I also feel very strongly that I've done at least, I think I'm on at least my 97th lifetime 
and I'm sort of tired of it. So I kind of um, am trying to behave in this lifetime and learn all the lessons I feel like I'm supposed to learn. I'm sure I'm going to fail. I'm do. I'm sure I'm going to have at least one or two more lifetimes because you know how how it goes. But um, yeah, I feel like I I don't want to. Um, yeah. Yes, I see what you did there, Molson man. So clever. So yeah, I just um yeah, I don't I don't uh I don't I don't think murder murder is gonna be the case that they gave me. So <laughs> but anyway, well you guys been on here a minute. I'm kind of getting tired. I had a long day. And just to let you guys know, okay. So I'm coming live tomorrow because tomorrow's Thursday and I'm going to do the, the second night of um, the 12 horrors of Christmas. Uh, but Friday, remember, we were supposed to do part two of the Courtney Love roast. Well, my beloved other half, Dr. B, has some stuff going on Friday. And so she asked, could we please postpone it until Saturday? So I said, of course, because how could I say no to Dr. B? Have y'all met her? So we're going to do uh, the part two of Courtney's roast on Saturday, which I actually think is going to work out better because it gives Dr. B and I a little more time to go through everything. And so we can have it ready and put together for the stuff read. she does that part i don't like to um to watch a whole lot of the stuff you know how i like to do it i like to give my uh in the moment honest initial reaction and impression so she does all that stuff and this is going to give her time to do that plus um everybody can sleep in right from the work week sleep in on saturday morning and then do whatever you got to do and saturday night Oh, good. Yay, Molson, man. That's awesome. Okay, cool. So then that's what we're going to do. We're going to do it on Saturday night. Um, I think we're going to try to maybe start it a little bit earlier, maybe go at um, 8 East Coast time, but more than likely it'll probably, it'll, it'll be somewhere between 8 and 9, Okay. I don't want to like commit to something right now because I haven't talked to you. I know I love her too, Kelly. I haven't talked to her and like nailed down all the details or whatever. But yes, for sure, Saturday, it is a date. And then the following roast, because I feel like I've tortured you guys too much with these polls for the rest of the year, right? The next one we're going to do is Luca Magnata after that. Okay. So that way... um, Nobody has to do a poll for 2021. The polls are over. I feel like we've all had enough of the polls. So anyway, y'all, thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. Thank you to the mods. Thank you, guys. Um, I'll see y'all tomorrow night at 8. All right. Bye.